A young man emerges from his bedroom. He stalks down the hallway to his living room and gets himself a glass of water. Out of the corner of his eye, he sees it. A small, sticky note sits on the back of his desk chair. He grabs it and sees that it's reminding him of some errands he needed to do. But it's strange, because he has no recollection of putting it there. What seemed at first to be just a simple oddity, a slip of memory, turned quickly into a fight for his very life itself. Each of our stories today will have a spooky premise with a surprisingly simple twist. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to speak with the experts. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. In May 2015, Reddit user rbradbury1920 posted on the subreddit rlegaladvice searching for legal recourse for a problem he was having with his landlord. He noted that on the 15th of April, he found a yellow post-it note on his desk with a reminder of some errands that he had told no one about. On top of that, the writing on the note was in some strange handwriting that he'd never seen before. Initially, he had thought nothing of it, and supposed that he had written it himself in some half-asleep state which would explain how he could not recognize the note. Days later, on the 19th, he found another post-it on the back of his desk chair. It read, Make sure to save your documents. He immediately checked the door to his apartment, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. He checked the windows, still nothing. The note was written in the same handwriting as the last, but he was beginning to doubt no one had broken in. He made a decision. If whoever was pulling these pranks on him wasn't going to let themselves be caught, you would have to lay a trap. He positioned a webcam to watch his desk and set it up to record any motion it saw. Whatever happened, he was gonna catch whoever it was this time. If no one broke in, who... Or what? ...had been leaving notes. Then came the third note. It sat there, steadfast and horrible, almost daring him to read it. He approached, slow and agonizing, and read it. Our landlord isn't letting me talk to you, but it's important we do. He immediately turned to check his computer. The folder with the webcam footage was right on his desktop. He opened it, and to his terror, it was empty. It had been deleted. What about the, the recycle bin? He checked, but it had been emptied the night before. Before long, the realization dawned on him like a truck. Whoever had left the note had seen the webcam and deleted the footage. Not two days later, on the 1st of May, he found another note on the door to his bedroom. Unlike the other, this one was blank. As he stalked through his apartment, he found more and more. Notes of all colors were scattered like eyes in a wild dark all blank with the heaviness of the unknown. But that was the moment he realized. He ran back to his desk to look for a note he received from his landlord when he moved into the building. He didn't want it to be true, but there it was in plain black ink. The handwriting on the previous notes matched the handwriting on the letter. He was certain that it had to be so. The landlord was breaking into their apartment in the middle of the night! Or was there something far more sinister at work? My assistant did the legwork on this next story, do you want to take it away, Quiz? Sure, Brew. Our next tale of terror begins in a small suburb of Los Angeles called Sherman Oaks. Writer Carrie Poppy was living in the ramshackle guest house off of someone else's home when she encountered something she could not explain. It began after she went to an occult bookstore. When she arrived, she could feel something dark, something that she would have called a bad spiritual presence. It seemed to linger in her mind. She was overwhelmed by this negative feeling. When she left, she thought that her ordeal was over, but she was wrong. Whatever she had felt there had followed her home. At first, it was just the feeling of being stared at, but it quickly devolved into a physical feeling. In her words, I started to feel this pressure in my chest, sort of like the feeling when you get bad news, but it started to sink lower and lower and almost hurt. That's gotta be a ghost! What else could it possibly be? Maybe someone broke into our apartment? How do you explain the feeling in her chest then? Well, you can't explain everything. Can, can you explain how the sun rises every morning? Can you explain the love a mother has for her child? No siree. Soon, she started to hear strange sounds. A whooshing sound would fill her ears as if something was passing by her. But whenever she looked, she saw nothing but her two dogs conspicuously licking their own feet. Nope, nope, nope. That's, uh, that's definitely a ghost. This all added to what she called a disquieting feeling that something was there. 
Could it be possible that she was in fact being watched by some clandestine criminal lurking just outside her vision? Or was there something more moving about in the shadows? Our last story begins on the 15th of November, 1921. As a woman known only as Miss H and her family struggled to find a place to stay after their home burned down. After some desperate inquiries, they moved into an old Victorian house. It was broken down, had no electricity, and was lit by gas lamps instead. Miss H says that Mr. H and I had not been in the house more than a couple of days when we felt very depressed. The house was overpoweringly quiet. She goes on to say that the servants walked about on thickly carpeted floors so quietly that I could not even hear them at their work. Unfortunately, it wasn't quiet for long. One morning, I heard footsteps in the room over my head. I hurried up the stairs. To my surprise, the room was empty. I passed into the next room, and then into all the rooms on that floor, and then to the floor above, to find that I was the only person in that part of the house. Sometimes after she had gone to bed, she would hear tremendous noises from their storeroom. Sounds as if furniture was being piled against the door, as if china was being moved about, and occasionally a long and fearful sigh or a wail. She would even feel as if someone was following and going to touch her. Was there someone or something in the house? One day, when she passed from her family's drawing room to the dining room, Miss H watched a strange woman, dressed head to toe in black, sailed through the room toward her. But as Miss H walked steadily on into the dining room to meet her, she disappeared. Later, Miss H's son came into her bedroom asking why she had called him. She told him that she didn't, which confused him. Then, with big and startled eyes, he said, Who was it then that called me? Who made that pounding noise? Miss H, against her own suspicions, assured him that it was just the wind rattling against his window. But he insisted that there was someone looking for him. Then came the last straw. Miss H had been in bed for some time, the lights in the house were drawn down, and the last patterings of the children had slowed. All was quiet. She lay thinking about the strange noises when her bedsheets were torn off her body and she felt a sudden force pin her down. It felt as if she had been stuck on the shoulder. But as she recovered and looked about the room, she saw something that chilled her to the bone. At the foot of her bed sat two dark figures, a man and a woman. The woman was young, dark and slight and wore a large picture hat. The man was unrecognizable. Miss H could do nothing but lay paralyzed, in stock terror, as the figure stared back. Oh, it's like Parasite! You know, the movie! With the people hiding in the house! Now the family's gonna get slowly picked off one by one! Perhaps... Wink? Do people say wink when they wink? Ah, oh, don't wink at me! Just tell me, please! Let Quiz conclude Poppy's story and you might see it. Nearing the end of her rope, Poppy decided to contact a group of ghost hunters. Though, as she said, they were a special kind of ghost hunters. They were skeptics. She gave them a task of giving her an explanation for her experience, to which they replied, Have you heard of carbon monoxide poisoning? And to her ultimate chagrin, she discovered that the symptoms of CO poisoning include a pressure on the chest, confusion, loss of consciousness, auditory hallucinations, and an unexplained feeling of dread. She called the gas company telling them she thought that she had a gas leak and they needed to send somebody immediately. When the technicians arrived, they said, It's a really good thing that you called us tonight because you could have been dead very soon. What about the kid with the sticky notes then? His landlord had to be screwing with them. Well, as it turns out, he was leaving notes all over his own apartment. He says in another Reddit post, on further inspection, the letter from his landlord didn't match up with the handwriting on the notes. Also, it wasn't even a letter from my landlord. It was a letter from my mom. So you're telling me the landlord wasn't breaking it? Nope, it was simple carbon monoxide poisoning. On its own, carbon monoxide, or CO, isn't necessarily dangerous. In his post, he had asked for legal advice, but in the end, received life-saving information because when he plugged in his CO detector, it read at 100 ppm, parts per million. 
which doesn't seem that high, but you can start to feel the effects of poisoning at levels as low as 10 ppm. The problem is that gas fills up spaces like a liquid does. Breathing a little bit of CO won't hurt you, but the real danger is when it builds up. When you burn something, the fire uses up oxygen and replaces it with carbon dioxide. As CO2 builds up and the fire has less oxygen to burn, it begins to let off carbon monoxide. If your home or any other space you're in has bad ventilation, it can make that space more prone to buildups of gases. And when the concentration of CO in a space increases, your body starts using it instead of the air to breathe. That means that instead of putting oxygen into your bloodstream, your lungs just pump you full of carbon monoxide instead. This leads to hypoxia, or low blood oxygen, which is a pretty bad time. With low oxygen, your heart rate increases, a cough will start, skin may turn blue, and most importantly to our ghost stories, it makes you confused or delirious. What about Mrs. H? Their issue was that their furnace was sending CO fumes back into the house instead of out of the chimney. It was because of the quick thinking of Mrs. H's brother-in-law that they ever discovered the problem. The spooky thing about carbon monoxide is that it's odorless and colorless. You won't know it's there unless you're looking for it, and it'll suffocate you in your sleep. In R. Bradbury 1920's words, the passiveness is the scariest element to it, I think. If you think that you might have a CO leak, then you should immediately go outside and call the fire department or your gas company to come test. The best way to make sure you and your loved ones are safe in the future, though, is to make sure you have a working carbon monoxide detector. Test it regularly and ensure your home is well ventilated. Like a ghost, carbon monoxide exists not out of spite, but because there is nowhere else for it to go. It can kill us just by coexisting with us. So, in that way, it is also ghost-like. Just as ghosts are the remnants of souls of the living trapped in an earthly form, so too is carbon monoxide just the remains of human consumption, trapped in an airtight seal. So often is the truth less exciting than what we fear, but I take comfort in that. Like Poppy has said, you don't have to live your whole life worried that you'll walk into another haunted house. Call the gas company if you feel this again. Just in case you need a reminder, take this little poem I wrote. If oxygen is what you need, then take a moment just to breathe. But if you find yourself confused, carbon monoxide has been diffused. What a twist on a ghastly tale. If dark mysteries are your domain, for a tale about how one young girl's disappearance led to a tangled web of deceit and crime that spanned from the lowest depths of the Italian Mafia to the heights of the Holy See itself, Pope John Paul II. Click here to join me on my channel, Twist.